Before I get into the rest of it, I want to address something that resurfaced roughly a week ago. Rachel Nichols and people like her started talking about the Lakers having no depth and the challenges that they're going to face going into the playoffs with their lack of depth. <laughs> I already did one video about this, just how spoiled the Lakers are and how absurd their depth is. But what are they talking about? Like they mentioned Gabe Vincent, who hasn't played all year, and they're still absurdly uh, deep. Yeah, well, what is Gabe Vincent doing on a team with that much depth? Uh, Jared Vanderbilt is out right now. Okay, what else? What else is the problem? So you still have like three starting lineups. Oh, Christian Wood. <laughs> Jeez, they have so many players on that team. It's hard to keep track. But you know, the LeBronites are going to say Christian Wood isn't any good anyway, despite the fact that he is. So what are you all complaining about? So after that list of injuries, the Lakers are still just more stacked than any team in the NBA by a long shot. This is just another narrative to talk about what LeBron's team overcame. And you know, if the Lakers end up doing well in the playoffs, they're going to say it was a LeBron-led team, even though we all know it's not a LeBron-led team. So it helps to put this into perspective. So once we get past the starters that everybody recognizes on the Bucks, we have Thanasis, <laughs> we have Marjan Bouchamp, Danilo Gillinan, Andre Jackson Jr., Chris Livingston, Ty Ty Washington Jr. Yeah, yeah, let's swap those benches, huh, Lakers? And every time LeBron is out, these guys show what they're capable of. You know, they have an opportunity to show how deep the team is, how much these guys can do when someone isn't in their way and or hindering them. Uh, which I guess this is a good time to mention how the media is just scrambling to come up with explanations for how the Lakers keep winning without LeBron James. And yeah, I don't watch this show, but it came on. It just was what played next in my YouTube feed. And Skip's a garbage show, and it is garbage. It's just funny that people call Skip a LeBron hater, because even his show is an excuse-making factory for LeBron James. And, you know, what they said repeatedly was, um, these guys need to get it together when LeBron is there. You know, why can't they do this when LeBron is there? Uh, answer your own question using critical thinking. But no, they, they're putting the blame on the players as if the players actually are worse. Like their talents disappear when LeBron is playing instead of looking at the obvious explanation. And of course, they go on to say, you know, this, this team is nothing in the playoffs without LeBron James, except that all evidence points to the opposite. All evidence points to the opposite of that being true. But hey, we're living in the LeBron James era. Evidence doesn't count for much anymore, does it? And I will address the refs. I know everybody's irate about the refs. It's tough when the Lakers have three more players on the floor, but the wind kind of got took out of my sails to talk about the refing because the Bucks also blew a lot of opportunities. And one that stands out in my mind, and I almost posted it while I was watching the game, was Anthony Davis just plain holding Giannis back with his arms on that inbounds play. But then Giannis just like really strangely blew it. And I don't know, it, I just didn't feel like posting the video because the way that he blew it afterward <laughs> was so ridiculous. On the other hand, you know, both teams go in slumps. You know, you can't expect people not to have bad streaks and everybody's exhausted in overtime and double overtime. So really that's an argument that the refereeing matters even more. You know, everybody is going to have a bad 
stretch. And if the refs are on one side more than the other, then the team that's having the bad stretch but has the refs is going to come out on top. But, you know, we all know this. We know the referee favoritism of the Lakers. I don't, I don't know how much more there is to say about it. We're just all living through it. Speaking of refereeing, uh, okay, first I'll say something nice. Uh, Austin Reeves probably had more in-the-moment shots, clutch shots, in that one game than LeBron has had in the last two seasons. He's not afraid of the moment. And he shows, he actually shows pretty good ba at basketball skill and athleticism as well as shooting ability. Um, on the other side of that is that the refs reward him for things that he should not be getting rewarded for, and he flops. And I, I saw flops on both ends, and I don't know how the NBA can ever expect flopping to go away when not only are they not assessing the fines and the technicals that they're supposed to be, but they're still rewarding people for it. You go, you go to the ground and the refs are going to fall for it. Go to the ground and the refs are going to fall for it. Unless, of course, it's a clutch client who's throwing someone else to the ground and then the refs uh, turn a blind eye. Speaking of blind eye, I know a lot of people were as annoyed as I was of LeBron James constantly stepping out onto the court and getting in the ref's faces, even when he isn't even suited up to play. And I was trying to find the exact wording for this in the NBA rules. It does indeed appear to be a technical, but a lot of it, the wording kind of leaves it up to a judgment call. The referees can assess a technical. So we're back to what we're all dealing with. The referees are allowed to choose to allow him to get away with these things. Oh, man. And yes, the travel. <laughs> I mean, they don't call that in the NBA anymore. And LeBron James gets about three more steps than that supposed Giannis travel every single time he drives. Yeah, it's, it's, oh my God. I can't say that I was thrilled with Anthony Davis's grimacing, um, his exaggerated discomfort faces, but I will say he kept battling. And man, that guy was doing it at both ends. I can actually believe that he was exhausted. And man, he just had clutch block after clutch block, um, threatening in the paint, causing people to adjust or reconsider their shots. And he hit some big shots at the end. Man, pretty nice to have him. Pretty nice to have D'Lo. Pretty nice to have Austin Reeves. Pretty nice to have Dinwiddie. Pretty nice to have Prince. It's even pretty nice to have Jackson Hayes sometimes. Oh my God. I, I listed Rui Hachimura almost last. That's how deep that team is. I almost forgot about Rui. <laughs> Rui is a massive asset. Rui is playing lights out. And then you also have Cam Reddish. Only played about seven minutes last night. And you also have Max Christie. Uh, played about seven minutes last night. Now, not that I would play him, but you also have LeBron James. So, you know, that adds to your depth. If you would bring him off the bench here and there like they should, Lakers would be doing even better. And then there's Maxwell Lewis. I mean, every single person on the team isn't a first pick all-star player, but they're pretty damn good. And that's a lot of people that are pretty damn good. After each night's games have concluded, I like to go to the NBA.com stats home screen and look at the leaders for the night. I take a screenshot, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is to keep track of, and at the end of the season, show people that LeBron James never shows up here. 
despite everybody always saying how great he is, somehow he's never <laughs> on this leader's page. <laughs> and now last night's different because he didn't play. Uh, but look how great his teammates were. Eight teams played last night. Some of these rosters had 13 active players that saw court time. That's 104 potential players that could have shown up on this leaders page. Look how many of them were, were Lakers. Now, I have another point to make. I said it's not fair to include the Knights when LeBron James doesn't play. Yeah, and then I thought, well, why not? You know, the fact that the guy sits out a lot should count against him. If he's choosing not to be out there competing, if he's choosing to rest instead of contend with being one of the leaders, why shouldn't that count against him? Yeah, I, I'm tired of how we reward people for laziness. Even if you don't want to call it laziness, I don't think people should be rewarded for resting their bodies. You're a pro athlete. You're supposed to be getting wear and tear on your body. You're certainly being compensated enough. <laughs> as much as these guys are making, they should actually have to be in wheelchairs the rest of their lives to, <laughs> to try and justify the amount of money that they're making. I said this in a podcast earlier this year, but how has it been successfully driven into everyone's brains that pro athletes should get to choose being a pro athlete for a career and not face any consequences? You get to have all the riches, all the fame, and preserve your body? Man, that's a pretty nice deal. And in the meantime... The game is suffering. Yeah, the players have become corporations. That occurred to me today. The amount of power that they have. Their unwillingness to compete when it could hurt them or hurt their image or hurt their profit margin. Like, they're not actual athletes anymore. They're certainly not actual competitors. They are corporations. And their approach to the game is the approach of a corporation. A bunch of individual corporations walking around out there. Eh, you know, I don't care that much about winning. I'm certainly not going to cause my corporation to go through a profit loss. I don't want us to have a weak quarter. Jesus Christ. Well, this podcast got a little long, so I'm not going to include the footage in this one. But after I watched the, that game last night, I got caught up watching the 1993 All-Star game. Man, that was a good game. Man, that was good basketball. I'm going to post that. I, it, like I said, this episode is too long. I'll just do a separate episode comparing last night's game to that All-Star game and show you the differences. But off the top of my head, I'll say, today's athletes would die of a heart attack trying to keep up with the pace that I saw in that All-Star game alone, which, by the way, went into overtime. Imagine... Imagine caring enough. <laughs> I, I think the 1987 game that I posted also went into overtime. I mean, these guys actually cared. Were they even getting bonuses? Hold on. Let me go and check if they were even getting bonuses. Uh, I, I couldn't find anything specific to what they used to get paid. I'm thinking that they didn't. I think that there was like a small incentive for the winning team. But uh, you guys answer that for me. I, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, the other thing about it was watching how many jacked dudes were on the floor. And this brings me back to the fact that I was fooled by the narrative of the bigger, faster, stronger thing. We have this idea in our heads that everybody today is like a super athlete out there. But name them. Tell me who today is super jacked. Okay, like Giannis is ripped. He's got pretty big arms. I'm not sure if he qualifies as jacked, but how shredded he is uh, makes up for that. So we'll, we'll include him. Now, LeBron James is big. He's all around really big. I'm not sure jacked is the right word, though. Like if you compared him to the arms of a Grant Williams or a Desmond Bain. So 
There's who I can think of off the top of my head. You guys correct me where I miss the blanks. Now, that 1993 All-Star game had giants like Carl Malone, Larry Johnson, um, Shaq, <laughs> David Robinson. It, it, look at Michael's body. I know he's not a huge dude, but like there is not an ounce wasted there. That and look, I would take those arms. That's it looks pretty muscular to me. All right, I need to go edit the footage. I'll catch you on the next one.